morning and welcome to our service. We are members of St. Luke's Anglican Church in Dartmouth, Nova Scotia, coming together on this Zoom platform to record a service of morning prayer from the Book of Alternative Services for this, the second Sunday after Pentecost, June the 6th, 2021. Our team is here to lead us through the prayers, but we will have a slideshow going on with the different ways of participating, and please feel free to join us at home. If you want to download a copy of the Book of Alternative Services, you can do so through a link in the description of this video that will take you to the National Church webpage. And also in the description, you will find a link to our Canada Helps webpage where you can make a financial contribution to the parish. Let us prepare to worship Almighty God. Your word, O oh Lord, is truth. Sanctify us in the truth. We'll sing in the morning a song of creation, of your breath that stirs up the waters to birth. And here at the fount of Christ's mercy, we'll join you, no heirs of heaven's tools of all your gracious love. How Naaman was cleansed in the flower of your grace. How when we were sinking, our sin you released us. You laugh in health and dance in love before your face. We'll sing in the evening a song of your pastures, of rivers that gladden the city of God. And when we arrive on the bank of our Jordan, Lord, open our lips, and our mouths shall, shall, shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. All glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Alleluia. The Lord is our light and our life. Oh, come, let us worship. Be joyful in the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness and come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He himself has made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and call upon his name. For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. And his faithfulness endures from age to age. The Lord is our light and our life. O oh, come, let us worship. Our psalm is Psalm number 138, found on page 895. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and praise your name. Because of your love and faithfulness. You have glorified your name. And your word above all things. When I called, you answered me. You increased my strength within me. All the kings of the earth will praise you, O Lord. When they have heard the words of your mouth. They will sing of the ways of the Lord. That glory is the glory of the Lord. Though the Lord be high, he cares for the lowly. He per perceives the haughty from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you keep me safe. You stretch forth your hand against the fury of my enemies. Your right hand shall save me. The Lord will make good his purpose for me. O Lord, your love endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. 
God of creation and fulfillment, help us to seek and discover your purposes, that we may become willing instruments of your grace, and that all the world may come to love and praise your name. In the kingdom of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our first reading this morning is taken from the first book of Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow your ways. Appoint for us, then, a king to govern us like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people and all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them. Just as they have done to me from the day I brought them out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice. Only say solemnly, warn them, and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will make your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to his work. He will take one tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king, whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you on that day. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us, so that we also may be like other nations, and that our king may govern us and go before us and fight our battles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty savior. Born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to his father Abraham. To set us free from the hands of our enemies. Free to worship him without fear. Holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. <clears throat> you, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins, in the tender compassion of our God. The dawn from on high shall break upon us to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Our second lesson this morning is from the Second Corinthians, beginning at verse 4. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure, because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. 
for what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. For him is Christ, whose glory fills the sky. Whose glory fills the skies, Christ the true, the only light, Son of righteousness, arise, triumph for the shades of night, they spring from on high be near, they star in my heart from Mark 3, verses 20 to 35. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him. For people were saying, he has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, he has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand. But his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother's mother and his brothers came and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and they said to him, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May these words glorify God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our gospel lesson today is in the form of a chiasm, which is like the letter X. It's basically like a poem where you go A, B, C, B, A. And so we have an, a reaction from the parents, the family, I should say family of Jesus. Then we have the reaction of the scribes, Jesus is teaching at the top, then the response to the scribes, and then finally the response to the parents. So the peak point is that teaching of Jesus, which we need to focus in on. I think we kind of take a little journey through this chiasm, kind of going up one side of the mountain and down the other. The first part is about the family of Jesus being concerned about what's happening. They're seeing these 
crowds of people coming in around him, so much so that he cannot move, he cannot eat, he cannot live. But the question becomes whether or not they're really concerned about his well-being, their well-being, or just embarrassed, worried, scared. We're not really sure what the motivation is behind this, but we do know that they want him to cease what he's doing. They're concerned and want him to leave that place and come with them. Perhaps they're already aware of what's going on, that these scribes that are there and starting to say things like, well, he's casting out demons by Beelzebul, that they're going to try to protect him, try to make sure that he doesn't face kind of like a public charge or humiliation or, or perhaps embarrassment. Why are those scribes coming to Jesus? Part two of this journey. Well, I suspect it's because he has crowds gathering around him and crowds aren't gathering around the scribes to hear what they have to say. They're probably more than a little bit jealous, concerned about false teaching, which really is about their authority being questioned, I think. So Jesus' response is very well thought out. He first talks about the, the scribes who have come. And he basically puts them in a very bad position where he notes that a house divided cannot stand. Now, some people think that's Abraham Lincoln who said that, but I think I know who Abraham Lincoln got it from. The whole idea here is that if Jesus is casting out demons, devils, by Satan, how does that make any sense? It must be a power of God. And so he's using logic against these scribes to get them to either say he's of Satan and therefore they're being illogical, or they have to retract what they were saying and confirm that he's doing it by the power of God. So they're kind of caught in a catch-22, a very clever place to be. And at the peak of this mountain, we have this saying about a strong man needing to be bound up in order to plunder his house. And who is this? What is this thing that they're going to plunder? It does seem to be the people, the people who have gathered to hear that, that perhaps the scribes want to bring them back into, into their fold, to have them crowd around them, to follow the traditions of the people. So they're going to find a way of trying to bind him. They want to stop his teaching by basically making him look foolish or evil or incompetent or that somehow he is unqualified and therefore people should ignore him. He is not the truth. That's a difficult place for Jesus to be in, of course. But we start coming down the other side of the mountain. We start to have these questions about who are these people? And that's the thing. The people that are gathering around Jesus are the very ones that need to hear that message of God's love and inclusion. It's the very people that were driven away from the scribes in the first place. And what they're trying to do, both the family and the scribes, is in fact tie up this strong man. They're trying to find ways of getting Jesus to leave what is his treasure. They're trying to find ways of plundering and taking him or the treasure away. What are we doing here? I think this really is very a, a very powerful reading for what we're encountering in our world today. This is June, which is traditionally Pride Month, although in our particular area we'll be celebrating that in August this year because of the pandemic, but we are thinking about a community of people who historically have been told mostly by the religious, including the Christian church, that their way of being is unacceptable, unacceptable to God, that they are sinners, and that they're not welcome, that they need to change and not be who they are. And we have seen the pain that comes with that. We have heard of stories of people who have self-harmed and committed suicide, who have hidden for years because they felt embarrassed, or scared, or terrified to be who they really are and who God created them to be. These are probably people who would have come and sat at Jesus' feet and felt welcome and heard the word of inclusion. 
this is also a time when we're beginning to mourn again the death of so many children in residential schools. We've heard the stories. We heard the reports through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And now we have uncovered a mass grave lot where unnamed children were left uncared for, without proper funerals, without family acknowledgement. We're very aware of how a group of people said, you're not good enough. We're very aware of how the religious authorities thought there was something inferior and that they had something more righteous and godly for this other, these other people. I think these are the people who would gather around Jesus' feet and crowd in around him to be embraced and loved by God. It's really a difficult reading for those who have strong connections, as I do, to the institutional church. For people who love the church and what it stands for, to see that it has not done a good job of representing the love, compassion, reconciliation, and hope that Jesus was brought into this world to reveal. It's easy to try to walk away and just wash our hands of it because we're so filled with grief and pain. But I think what I've come to understand is first, if there's going to be systemic changes, we have to be part of that change. And that the message of Christ is still good and holy and pure, even if the institution did not do a good job of bringing that reality into the world. The other thing is, is that the church and the government that run these residential schools they are, yes, responsible, but as we all are, this was something that settlers had throughout their whole community, really. This was a racism, a superiority, that, that a privileged life that, that benefited many settlers in order to keep a certain people at bay, to keep them in poverty, who saw them as a threat or worried about, worried about their presence, who treated them as less than civilized or human. This was, this was a thread of, of racism that was tightly woven into every aspect of society, not just those two institutions. And I, I feel like walking away kind of passes off responsibility to the other instead of taking responsibility for myself, for a heritage, for being part of a movement that benefited from that racism. And I truly believe that if we're going to follow in the master's footsteps, to follow Jesus' teaching, it means that we have to be present in those uncomfortable places. And as I said on Wednesday, in Wednesday service, to really start to unravel all of those ways that racism has been tightly woven into my own life and allowed me to be in a place of privilege. I cannot sidestep that responsibility. And so I think that's what Jesus is doing here today. He can be more comfortable and listen to the words of his mother and his brothers and step away from this, to stay clear of the conflict, to keep clear of all these people that the rest of the society is looking down upon and saying, they're not worthy. You're getting a reputation. What are you doing? You're upsetting the authorities. Instead, Jesus heals. He listens deeply. He has compassion. He has relationship. Where the others were trying so difficult, both family and authorities, to bring him under their power and influence, he was just sitting, being with and present and loving. And so, when that question is asked, you know, what's going on here? Your parents are out there calling for you. He, he says, who is my mother and my brother and my sister? It's these ones. These ones who are gathered here who do the will of my father. Not doing the will of the scribes. Not doing the will of the families. Not doing what society is telling them the, is the right thing to do. But instead, coming to God discerning what God's will is, 
to find that heart of love and to share it. And that is my hope of what the Christian church is, a community of the faithful who is discerning God's love. It's just so hard to leave behind all of the things that we have been taught about how we're to treat others, because we learn through various ways that, that we want to feel superior to our brothers and sisters. We want to believe that somehow we're better than the others, that we have better things, we have better knowledge, we have better religion, we have better social standing, we have better whatever. We just find all sorts of ways that we look down upon others. See that person over there? They have so many tattoos. They're ridiculous looking. You see that person over there? That boy with the long hair and the painted nails? What's wrong with them? We have all of these social expectations pressing down upon us that stop us from seeing the other as an equal, as a beloved child of God, as someone worthy to be in relationship with us as well as with the Savior. The church should never be about who's in and who's out, and yet we have a whole history of doing that very thing. But my hope is, is that the church is also in the midst of discerning God's call, God's love for the world, and that many are changing their hearts and minds to a new way of being. It's not actually that new. It's what Jesus told us about 2,000 years ago. But he also told us that we're, O oh, ye of little faith. He scolded the disciples for not getting the message. He's, how many times do we hear in the Bible about being hard-hearted, about not being willing to change, a stiff-necked people? There's truth there, but there's hope there as well. And if we can stop being worried about what, our ex, what the expectations are that are being placed upon us, or with the baggage that we're dragging behind us of all the things that we were taught were right and wrong, instead of really critically looking at them through the eyes of what the Savior taught us, let them go and look instead through the eyes of love and compassion then I think we are set for a very bright, beautiful, and loving future. But it's not going to happen if we don't each take responsibility and accountability for the history, for the baggage that we're dragging along behind us. Each of us has to delve into our own stories, our own histories, and start letting go of those ties that are dragging that heavy weight behind us. Start finding ways of saying no to those expectations or those prejudices that still exist. That fear that we get when somebody different enters a bus with us or, or umpteen other things that cause us to not love our neighbor as ourself. I find this to be probably the most beautiful reading that we could have as we start Pride Month as we hear about the stories of First Nations people, as we continue to, to reflect on one year since George Floyd. How many ways have we brought our hatred, our worry, our fear into, into poor relationships with others that are hurtful, that oppress, and that tear down? that are totally contrary to what Jesus taught us. And so we can't just throw out the baby with the bathwater, so to speak, because that doesn't get rid of the problem. We can't just tear down our churches and pretend like everything is fine now. We all, all of us, the faithful, the secular, government officials, different organizations, we all have responsibility in seeing how our history has brought us to where we are and letting go of those expectations and other things that are hindering us from moving forward. Amen. Our hymn is, Here I Am, Lord. Here I 
Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In our diocesan cycle of prayer, we have been bid to pray for the clergy and people of the parish of St. Mark's Halifax and the Church of the Apostles Halifax. In prayer partnership, we also pray for St. George's Church, New Glasgow and St. Andrew's Church, Locks Road. We pray for the late Joan Kellaway, mother of Marion Mullins, who passed away this week in Newfoundland. Rest eternal grant unto her, O Lord, and may light perpetual shine upon her. Our prayers are also bid for Adam, Angela, Carol, Charlene, Jason, Joanne, Judy, Marge, Marilyn, Tommy, Vi, and for all those we name now both aloud and in the silence of our hearts. Our litany for the service is litany number four, found on page 113 in the Book of Alternative Services. In peace, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, hear and have mercy. 
Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for all who confess the name of Christ. Fill us with the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for those whose lives are bound in mutual love and for those who live in celibacy. Be their joy and their strength. Lord, hear and have mercy. For all in danger, for those who are far from home, prisoners, exiles, victims of oppression, grant them your salvation. Lord, hear and have mercy. For all who are facing trials and difficulties, for those who are sick and those who are dying, show them your kindness and mercy. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray for one another. May we always be united in service and love. Lord, hear and have mercy. We pray to be forgiven our sins and set free from all hardship, distress, want, war, and injustice. Lord, hear and have mercy. May we discover new and just ways of sharing the goods of the earth, struggling against, against exploitation, greed, or the lack of concern. May we all live by the abundance of your mercies and find joy together. Lord, hear and have mercy. May we be strengthened by our communion with all Christ's saints. Lord, hear and have mercy. Our colleague for today, gracious God, Give us such a vision of your purpose and such an assurance of your love and power that we may ever hold fast to the hope we have in Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please join with me as we say the Lord's Prayer. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our hymn is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to give you, everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit, oh, what needless pain we bear. Bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us in worship this morning. Our parish office is open Mondays through Thursdays, 9 a.m. until 12 noon. God bless.